Uh, I will call to order the meeting of the study session for the Planning Commission of the City of San Clemente for Wednesday, August 5th, 2020. Um, and uh, Gabriel, is Gabriel on? Or um, Oh. I'm sorry, Jennifer, I couldn't hear you. He's joining right now. Okay. We tricked you, Gabriel, and we started on time today. So, <laughs> so uh, I just called us to order. Are you there? Okay. I am here, yes. Okay, great. So I will ask you to um, call the roll, please. Uh, Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Kaczynski? Here. Commissioner Crandall? Here. Chair Pro Tem uh, Wu? Here. Vice Chair Blackwell? Here. And Chair Rulin? Here. And we have um, one item on our study session, a, a continuation of our zoning ordinance amendments uh, discussion. We have three more sections to cover tonight. And uh, Jennifer will be uh, taking us through and uh, letting us know, um, uh, uh, giving us an overview where we need it. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to take it? Yes, thank you, Jennifer Savage, uh, Senior Planner with the City of San Clemente. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, uh, myself, as well as Christopher Wright, Associate Planner 2 with the City of San Clemente, will be presenting the uh, subject areas for tonight's study session. We have a definition, non-conforming, and accessory dwelling units. Mm -hmm. Uh, the format for this evening will be the same as the first study session, whereby I will um, we will allot 30 minutes for each uh, study session subject area, and I will um, please forgive me in advance interrupt you or the discussion uh, with five minutes left within that 30 minutes. This will uh, enable us to get through all of the subject uh, areas, at least um, touch on them and get some direction from the planning commissioners, and allow us time at the end of those 90 minutes to close out um, this evening's study session with any follow-up questions and discuss next steps. Uh, I will begin with the first uh, subject area, which is uh, definitions. This subject area covers 11 different items. Uh, most of these items are to uh, add clarity to terms that are already used in the regulations or that there was confusion about uh, in our code. Uh, other definitions that are addressed in this subject area are to address a planning commission interpretation and current uh, regulations for state law. So what we're looking for tonight is for direction and discussion and any questions or comments from the Planning Commission on these particular uh, proposed amendments to the code. And again, these are considerations to change the definition. So um, you have, you have the, the floor to make any recommendations on what to pursue and not to pursue as we move forward with the zoning amendments. That concludes staff presentation, and we look forward to your discussion and direction. All right. Uh, do any planning commissioners um, have you know questions or observations for staff? Uh, sure. This is Bart. Um, Jennifer, uh, can you tell me, uh, are we going through just the definitions for the first section right now, or are we going through all definitions? We are going through all of the definitions that are contained in attachment to starting on page six in your packet. Okay, uh, and for each one, can you give us an explanation of why um, we are modifying the existing definitions to make sure that the Absolutely. modification does what we're trying to do? Have it do. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the first definition is alleys, and that's there to uh, 
create a clarification of the term alley that's used in Title 17, and it would add a reference to the engineering technical specifications in regards to setbacks for garages, carports, and parking spaces that uh, back out into the alley. Cultural okay. facilities well, is proposed. Can we comment on each one as we go by them? Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, for alleys, um, it seems we're making the assumption that the property line is on the edge of the alley. I'm sure in like the Los Molinos district and all, the property lines run down the center of the alley, and the alley is maintained by the property owners um, rather than the city, uh, as opposed to the alleys we have uh, up in uh, the T-zone. Um, so does this, um, I'm questioning whether this addresses all those different types of conditions um, for setback. Let's see, for engineering technical specifications, uh, it would uh, address all of those uh, scenarios. In terms of setbacks, uh, I will take a look at those uh, conditions at Los Molinos. Uh, when we come back with this um, as a public hearing. Okay, very good. Um, because I think that that's quite, um, we may find that in the business districts, and, uh, excuse me, the industrial districts and all also. Uh, so we need to find all the different types of setups where it sometimes it's an easement on the property, sometimes it's a, um, a property line down the center of the alley, so the setbacks wouldn't be from the same place. It would, you know, some width of the alley has to be determined, and uh, that might be in the deeds. So it may be more complicated than we think um, in reality. Yeah, and just a point of clarification, if there is an easement on a property, um, the even if the setback uh, would put a structure uh, within that easement, the easement language itself would not allow construction uh, within the easement. So mm -hmm. it would then, by way of the easement, require a greater setback than would uh, than would be the case without that easement. It, right. It would allow you to build up to, well, the deed would allow you to build up to the uh, edge of the easement. But then we're looking to have at least, um, assuming 24 foot back up space, into the alley, which 12 may be to the center of the alley on the easement. So um, uh, it just needs a little more um, looking into. Thank you. Um, another comment too, and, and I could be wrong about this because I can't think of a specific example. I just feel like I've seen it. <laughs> um, the definition of the alley is that it's a secondary means of access to a budding property, but I seem to uh, I seem to think that we've got places in town where we call them alleys, but it's either the main or the only way to access the building. For instance, maybe the front entrance of the building is on the alley, or there just isn't any other street that you could reasonably get to that building. So, um, like I said, I can't I can't give you specific examples. This is just sort of my feeling from over the years, um, but I'm. Yeah, are we sure that this is the definition we want? If we do have some small streets that might be considered alleys, just sort of in terms of how they look or feel, but now we're treating them as streets, and maybe they would have a different setback from what we might normally have as a result. I think you've got a good observation that I think the word secondary may not always apply. It may actually be a primary. Uh, access, uh, particularly for vehicles, maybe not for pedestrians, but certainly for vehicles. The primary alley, one of the primary alleys down in Los Molinos that uh, goes uh, down past the Elks Club and down there is actually a street room to it, although it looks like an alley. Uh, and it's considered an alley, but we actually have a street naming. So some of your points are exactly right. The business does, some of the businesses down there front onto that street slash alley. Uh, yeah, even privately owned. Okay, at least the northern part of the Paseo. 
there are homes there, for instance, where there, you know, there's garages and, you know, stairs to the upstairs apartment units, that sort of thing on the alley. So it could be considered a primary access, um, in that respect. So we may want to think about that, the term secondary or really make sure we, you know, we don't have any unintended consequences. Thank you. Uh, staff will definitely take a look at that and see where there may be conflicts uh, for multiple reasons uh, throughout the city. Uh, and inter is there anyone else that wanted to have input on alley? Yeah. Uh, Zeng, um, I just want to, if the alley, if the alley is not used as a secondary means of access, is the property still subject to a uh, requirement, the, the same setback requirement? Yes, um, so if you have an alley, um, there is the potential that there are scenarios in the city where the alley would be considered the front. Uh, if the alley is considered your rear, in cases of such like uh, such as the through lot, you would still potentially have a front setback there for the primary dwelling. Okay. Anything else on the alley definition? Okay, we can go to the next one. Thank you, and I'm gonna go a little out of order here in just an interest in time. Um, so uh, I'm gonna skip cultural facilities and go to hedges, chimney height, roof element, and lot depth. The four of those definitions were put in to add clarification um, where there were questions. Hedges are, um, considered in a section with fences. Uh, it's been confusing on how to measure chimney height for both applicants and staff. Uh, it's also been confusing about what is a roof element in terms of measuring a building height. And there are also instances where it's confusing on measuring lot depth. And the proposed amendments for lot depth would help. It wouldn't solve every scenario given the unique uh, configurations of some parcels in the city, um, but would help uh, to some degree. Jennifer, I have some uh, comments on the roof element. Uh, I think the current definition is not accurate. Uh, there are many reasons. Uh, a building may have different plate height, uh, may not have, uh, in other words, uh, the front plate height may be different from the back side, so they may have different plate heights, or a concrete building may not have a plate at all. So, in my understanding, the roof, um, the roof element would be um, the part of the roof that separate from one, separate one from other. By, by walls. Just imagine you land on a roof, on a high point of a roof, and you start moving around. By the time you have a sudden drop vertically, and that's the boundary of your roof element. Um, so, and, and we mentioned a ridge. Uh, some, a flat roof will not have a ridge. A roof with a, a parapet, roof deck, they don't have a ridge. So there are a lot of things to be um, to be cleaned up here on the roof element definition. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I will jump on with uh, Shen on that one. Uh, we're looking at roof areas um, of a roof and. Um, Using a plate, I think we had a definition of a plate, and uh, we've been through this before, is not necessarily a wall with a top plate on it, but the um, structural support for the roof rafters and members. Um, so for a concrete building or block, it's where that roof is bolted to the, the wall, but uh, we do have shed roofs that don't have um, a ridge, but two different plate heights. Uh, we have domed roofs that have the same plate height, no ridge, but it has a height. 
Um, it almost seems like it could be almost impossible to try to craft one that talks about every structural element um, and condition and anticipate them. So I think it might be easier to just have this as roof planes um, and the height of them and just say the low port and the high point and then uh, go from there. Is, um, when definitions get so complicated, um, sometimes we're trying to do too much. And we have uh, a section um, for slope lots of how to calculate the um, uh, roof heights and the uh, high points of roofs, um, which uh, seems to work pretty well, to, uh, I think, Jennifer. Have you talked to building about that and um, their application of that section? Uh, we actually discussed this with the planners um, because it is the the planners that take a look at that that definition and use that method for measuring height, uh, and it, it, it is from the planners' <laughs> direction that we wanted to clarify the roof element, specifically because the measuring height was put in place to encourage buildings to be constructed that would slope with the down or upslope of a property, and rather than getting that, um, the way that it's measured now uh, is by averaging across the roof, you actually get uh, uh, non-varied uh, roof planes. So this is staff's attempt to to encourage that. Um, it sounds like doesn't work, but and then perhaps the 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 method that we currently have in place without a roof element definition does work. Well, I think roof element is fine, and it could just that's what we should define rather than all these other little things. Because architects and uh, been through this numerous times have fits when planning and building don't use the same terminology or the same um, processes for measuring things like roofs and all. So I would um, definitely think any of these definitions, etc., should be run by head of building department also to coordinate um, and do the best we can to have. Uh, uniformity between the two departments. Thank you, Je Jennifer. I, I think I think your goal is a, a, is a, is good. You know, we're trying to achieve that objective, but I just don't see how this new definition will solve the problem you identified. I understand uh, staff will take a look at it again and see if there is a way uh, to meet our, our goal. And if not, um, we will express that at the public hearing. Perfect. Anything else on those definitions? Uh, chimney height. Um, the fact of the matter is now the only chimneys we're going to have are chimneys that are vents for gas fired appliances. You cannot have a wood burning fireplace anymore. Yes, you can have a barbecue with, uh, those are typically gas fired now, but um, they could be uh, charcoal, etc. So there may be something there, but a normal house chimney um, is not necessary. You used to have to have the chimney go two feet higher than any part of the house within 10 feet. Now with a, um, a gas-fired appliance, that isn't the case. It can be considerably lower. So uh, there's another one I think we need to coordinate with um, building. Jennifer, I just Thank have you. additional comment on the building height. If you really want to achieve that stepping back or stepping down um, building massing, um, the, the best way is to uh, eliminate that average. In other words, um, here is the existing terrain. You raise it by 25 feet or whatever height limit. That's the top of your envelope. You should not encroach with some exceptions. So that way, you are f you're going to force the designer to, to have this terrace building slope. 
But it also means we're tightening the building height uh, um, regulation, so that needs to be carefully considered. And is that something that the Planning Commission uh, consensus-wise would want to pursue, eliminating the averaging? What's the proposal eliminating averaging from the average of the um, topology to the roof height? Correct, and rather follow the topology, the topography. And what would be the benefit of that, Commissioner Wu, as opposed to the averaging? Uh, I'm not proposing it. I'm just saying if the staff wants to achieve the objective to to encourage the building to step down, to follow the terrain, then that would be an effective way. Because right now we're letting people to average the building height. So the result would be um, they're going to want big, big roof element. So they can take advantage of the averaging. The one corner will be higher than, let, let's assume the building height is 25 feet. So maybe one corner they get a 30, but at the other corner they got a 20. So four corners average, they had a 25. So the top would be flat. Oh, well, it's a steel pitch roof in most of the case. But if we were to uh, limit the building height to 25 feet above the terrain without averaging, then people have to terrace the building. So each part, no part of the building would encroach into that 25 feet above terrain top envelope. That will force people to terrace the building, to step down, to cascade down along the topography. I'm saying that it would be an effective way, but I believe it's bigger than, you know, it's, this issue is more, it's bigger than just talking about a definition tonight. It has to come back uh, as a separate item, agendized, because it's overall, it tightens the building height limit regulation. Uh, Jim, what maybe we can do, I think, uh, and this is for um, uh, Gabriel also, this is something that I think we need to get the expertise of local architects and whatnot uh, to give us input who've worked with this, um, what we've got currently, and pick their brains. So I think we almost need a, a working meeting with um, either the uh, Orange County Architectural Guild or invite the local architects in to provide comments um, and suggestions. Um, because they're, they're the ones who work with it every day and see the difficulties. Uh, we know what the end product we want to look, see, and uh, uh, but maybe they have seen it in other jurisdictions, etc., and can give us some good insight on this particular item. Yeah, if we want to look at that change, I I agree. It'd be good, probably as a study session, and you know, bring in those experts and kind of have a an open discussion with them and get their feelings on it and be able to present to them, you know, here's our goals. Does the current way we measure it work or should we do something more absolute? Right. Uh, um, so um, we, we should also look at uh, looking to other cities and how they practice this. As far as I know, Laguna Beach has uh, this tighter control and they don't allow the averaging thing. Uh, the, their, their regulation is much more detailed, much tighter. But San Clemente is a little different. So whether we want to do it or not, uh, it needs to go through a, a, a little more expanded uh, um, public input and eventually get to uh, the city council to make that decision, I believe. So the building height is a sensitive issue in town. Gabriel, why don't uh, you and I talk about um, offline, we can talk about a uh, a potential study session with um, the architects and I think uh, you know Mark hit the nail on the head the the um, what are they again the Southern California the Southern Orange County Architects Association Architectural Guild Architectural Guild of Orange County so um, and I know um, 
Michael Luna is a member of that, um, or at least has been. So um, we should probably reach out and see if we can't put something together, Gabriel. Commissioners, I think your input is 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 important, and um, the way this is set up as more of uh, code amendments that are kind of cleanup items, and this seems to be something that's uh, much larger in scope. So uh, one way to approach this, which might be recommended, is to yeah, I think it's been mentioned before. Maybe this is considered independent, and this doesn't move forward with uh, code cleanup items. If it's going to be a little bit more involved, and maybe it needs to be, uh, that might be the right approach here. Yeah, and personally, I agree. I, I didn't want to hold up the code amendment change. Uh, this would be kind of a, a whole separate item on a separate track. Um, if anyone feels differently, speak up. It is a bigger, a much bigger item. I think not only the um, local designers, but also more importantly, um, property owners, the residents, and the public needs to be involved in that decision. Okay. Yeah. So let's, you know, yeah. Independent of this, we'll keep, you know, certainly full speed ahead with the uh, zoning ordinance change, and we'll worry about changing the roof roof height ordinance specifically as a separate item and get their input when time permits, as time permits. Thank you, commissioners. We have about seven minutes left for this subject area. Um, in in that regard, is there any particular uh, definition that you would like to take a look at now? And or are there any other recommended definitions to address as a separate larger item in the future? Yes. And, and I think we're going to have to talk about microbreweries and tap rooms. Um, so I actually think those are kind of, you know, one's, one item's controversial, the other one's critical in our community. So I think that we should, you know, give them their due and give them a little more time um, because those might be more time-consuming items um, than in the other sections. Um, yes. Hey, Jim. Jim, I, yes, do, I would like to – hi, thanks. I'd like to comment uh, quickly on just hedges. Uh, and Jennifer, I, I've read the um, proposed definition of a hedge. Uh, we're adding. Um, interesting that we have not had one all this time. But I think it might be worth expanding a little on that. Uh, in some jurisdictions, there's some issues when it comes to regulating hedges, and it's even made it to court. Um, when folks feel they need privacy and they want to put in, you know, plant material that is not a, you know, a, a structured uh, material like a, you know, semi block or wooden fence, vinyl fencing, etc., they'll simply put plant material in for either a visual buffer or sound buffer. That material could range anywhere from, you know, some sort of structured vine to, you know, trees. Um, and our definition is it's it's succinct, you know, and I'll read it. Our proposed definition said means generally dense vegetation so aligned as to form a physical barrier similar in shape and proportion to a wall or fence. And that is an interpretation really um, depending on who is, you know, you know, making that determination, whether it be a neighbor, a homeowner who, who you know, feels that whatever they've done does not qualify as a, as a hedge or a green wall, but maybe something else. Maybe they just like the way carrot woods like out the window. Um, so I would like to know if you'd be open to looking at something a little more expansive uh, so that, you know, we can really give some um, strength to, to that component. A hedge is clearly something that is, you know, structured in such a way to create a visual barrier, but it doesn't really, our definition doesn't really say that. And I just want to make sure that we have some protections in place. And, and I'm going to throw out, you know, an example of how it could read. And, you know, this is not new language for some of us on this call. It's pretty common, but we could do something like this. A hedge means a dense row of low-branching trees, shrubs, vines, or other plants, which encloses land, divides land into distinct portions, separates contiguous properties, obstructs the passage of light and air into adjacent land, or obstructs the vision of motorists or pedestrians on or near public roads. That way we have some you know, rationale behind it, because I think it, could, it can get sticky 
if we start to try to regulate plant material, if it's if you know if we're simply using a, a pruning, you know, uh, a manner of pruning as our criteria to to determine whether you know a row of plant material with no specific identification of plant material, anything that's you know trimmed to look like it's a wall or a fence, suddenly it's a hedge. When somebody could simply plant you know a row of evergreen you know trees and create a hedge without you know the effect of a hedge without making it more of a topiary type of a uh, design so I think it's worth discussing and um, like to know what your thoughts are on that uh, thank you for the suggested language we are open to suggestions and we have that read into the record thank you for that we have three more minutes in the subject area. Is there another de uh, definition that we'd like to discuss? Yeah, and Jennifer, I'm, I, I am going to extend the time that we spend on this particular section because I, I think we've got a couple Thank of you. important things to discuss. So, you know, my apologize. My apologies for overruling you. It's uh, going to be a rare occurrence. But right. um, if there's no more discussion and on hedges, we can talk about inland canyons. Uh, just uh, uh, how, how, Chair, I'm sorry. Could, mm -hmm. Do you want to specify how many um, more minutes you'd like to spend on this subject area? Let's set aside 20 minutes for now. Um, see see okay. where we are at that time. Thank you. Yeah, Jim, I will concur with uh, Michael. On those uh, hedges, I mean, how do we handle a row of um, uh, cypress? which can go to 30 feet, you can pack, pack them in next to each other, and it pretty much creates a wall, uh, and blocks view, et cetera. Um, and currently, I believe you can put that right up against the property line and let it grow. Well, this is uh, Zhang. Um, currently, the city doesn't have a view protection, um, so there's no view easement. That has something to do with not just the privacy, because you know, a, a row of Italian cypress is going to completely block some some peop, other people's view. But as of now, the city doesn't have view, have view protection. What other city called view equity, and the city had a opportunity in the past to to work on a tree ordinance, and the city council decided to um, not to deal with the private trees. So. So yes, that's a uh, that's an issue, and it's a uh, it's related to a bigger issue. <laughs> this is why we need some teeth on any definition that we have for a hedge, uh, and I say teeth, and I'm sorry, that's uh, probably an inappropriate um, word to use. I mean, we need some Thorns? justification. <laughs> justification. We need to give it some you know purpose, uh, other than. You know, simply being a green wall. I mean, wh why are we doing this? We we want to we want to create a mechanism to protect adjacent property owners from you know negative impacts, and those would be associated to maybe light uh, or air um, obstructing you know line of sight for motorists or, or pedestrians, public right of way. You know, in a in a situation where there'd be a, a negative impact on an adjacent property owner. That would be about all we could do, but otherwise we're regulating plant material, and yes, that can be a very slippery slope. We can put it in there, we might get a 30% return on folks that are going to be compliant. But if somebody really wanted to, if somebody really wanted to, um, you know, make it a discussion, it could really go a long way. It's it's, and it's not an uncommon this this sort of a. Uh, um, a, uh, the sort of language is, is consistent throughout many jurisdictions and ordinances. It's and it's often grouped into you know walls and fences. Uh, so, the, but there has to be some differentiation between you know plant material and, and hedges that are intended to, to you know serve a purpose. And you know if that's view obstruction, uh, and it's probably privacy. And I think folks have a right to privacy. But if that mechanism is is designed in such a way that it creates a negative impact on an adjacent homeowner. Aside from somebody maybe not wanting to look at, you know, a wall of green leaves, who would prefer to look at a stucco wall. I mean, that's that's different. But if we are allowing 
um, you know, for for something, we might as well, you know, give it some strength. And I, for, or if we're going to prohibit something, we might as well give our language, our code language, some strength. You know, why are we doing it? So. Any other input to staff on hedges? Sure, Roland, I was Hi, Jim. This is this is this is uh, Kuczynski. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, hedges is, looks like they're just putting it in uh, because section seventeen point twenty four point zero eight zero or point zero nine zero talks about encroachments, right? And um, they're just uh, adding adding that definition in there. The the, the height, the setback, and all that's already in there. That's something that commissioner, uh, the other commissioners were concerned about. Am, am I reading that incorrectly? That that is that is there. There is discussion about you know uh, varying heights and setback areas, front, side, and rear. Uh, and we're talking about a definition, but it's got a. I'm just trying to. All I'm trying to do is draw some attention to our definition and why we have setback regulations for it. And you know, if somebody's going to see a, a a rule for hedges, but we have no definition of a hedge, that definition, if we're going to add one, should have some you know value to it. There should be some substance there, some strength. Otherwise, you know, imagine you know uh, you know a homeowner you know, wants to put in some plant material. You know, on a property, you want to have a you know beautiful yard full of plants and shrubs and trees, and you get a letter from you know the city saying, well, you've got to you know remove or you know need to comply and remove your your trees because we believe it's a hedge. So it there should be you know there should be some strength to the definition. That's all I'm saying. So uh, would changing the word hedges to plant material, um, sir, uh, you know, uh, fix that? So now we're talking about the the you know the setback encroachment, which is a, another discussion. I think that if we're going to have definition for hedges in there, we should you know give it some strength. The plant material, I guess I don't know what what the other commissioners think. I I, I think it's a slippery slope. You start to regulate you know, plant material, you know, and yeah, it's. it's we might be we might be going a little in the weeds here, um, so I'll <laughs> suggest that I we've given actually a, a lot of uh, feedback to staff on hedges, so maybe we should let them chew on that and look at some of these uh, uh, issues and concerns we raised and see what they come up with. Is that acceptable to the commissioners? That's good. It would be great, and if we had legal on the call, I know our our legal representation is well has got to be well versed in this area and represents other jurisdictions as well. It would be interesting to get some feedback uh, in this forum, so that we can all hear you know what sort of issues have come up in the past, uh, you know, and what you know definitions are are most successful and how that's regulated. So maybe something in the future we can talk about. Okay, um, so if that's it on hedges, let's move on to um, Inland Canyons. Um, Jim, why did we skip cultural facilities? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think Jennifer had mentioned that she kind of excluded that for some reason. Uh, yeah, because she was she wanted to cover that other stuff. So I'm sorry, Jennifer. I'll let you pick the next item we discuss here. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to push us within the time. But cultural facilities um, is added in here because it is referenced as a permitted use in the code, but we don't have any uh, definition. So what staff did is they uh, explored the definitions for cultural facilities in other jurisdictions and came up with the proposed language that you have before you tonight. Uh, where is that used <coughs> in the code? I mean. Um, this could include churches. It could include judo um, gyms that teach a little of the philosophy of uh, of um, judo, etc. I mean, it's a pretty wide um, spectrum of things. 
And where do we limit cultural facilities? I guess I'm... I think what the staff thought here is very reasonable. You know, it's got a reasonable definition and we don't need to cover the waterfront on anything like that. Well, I do think Bart brings up a good point in terms of, you know, where do we use this definition? And if we use it, if it can cover all these other sort of unexpected things, if we use it in a lot of places or for something in particular, are we buying ourselves a problem? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know where else it's used. This is Jennifer. It is used as a use within the use table for public zones. And specifically, it is allowed with a use permit. And for the proposed definition, the intent was not to allow classes per se, but specifically the production or presentation or display of cultural items. Jennifer, I'd like to add a library to it. I'm not sure. I think we should add a library to it. Regarding historic architecture, I'd say it depends on the user inside, not on the status of being a historic structure in itself. In other words, if a building is a historic structure, it does not make it a cultural facility just because of that. It has to be the user inside. So I mostly agree with your definition with two things. The first is the library. The second is on botanical gardens. It's probably okay, but what if other people are asking about a nursery and horticulture things? There must be a line to draw. You know, I think I see where staff is going with this. Maybe it just needs to be tightened up a bit. But if I understand, Jennifer, you might be saying here that this might, a cultural facility might be a place where you regularly exhibit paintings. But it wouldn't be a place whose purpose was to teach people how to paint, for example. Do I have that correct? Correct. Or sell art. Sell art would be included in this? Would not. Just for the display. Just for the display. Okay. So it wouldn't cover a dance studio, but it would cover a dance, you know, someplace with a stage where you might have dancers. My only concern is what if you have a dance studio that's doing a dance, but that wouldn't, I guess that wouldn't be the primary use of it. So it wouldn't be a cultural facility. So I see where you're going, I think, but maybe we need to, I had to scratch my head a little bit, so maybe we can tighten it up a little bit to say it's for exhibits and performance. I think you've got that in here, but maybe we need to say, I don't know. I don't want to wordsmith for you. Thank you. Anything else from commissioners on cultural facilities? Okay. What's next, Jennifer? Thank you. So I think I heard someone want to talk about Inland Canyon. Well, let's read the Canyon Edge paragraph. The more I read it, it kind of gets confusing to me. I guess maybe everybody ought to read it, but I'm not sure. I captured the more I read it, the more I'm trying to visualize what we're trying to say here. As far as upper termination, cases where the top edge is rounded away from the face of the canyon as a result of erosional processes. Related to the presence of the canyon face, the canyon edge shall be defined as that point nearest the canyon beyond which the downward gradient of the land surface increases more or less continuously until it reaches the general gradient of the canyon. In the case where there is a step-like feature at the top of the canyon face, the landward edge of the topmost riser shall be taken to be the canyon edge. Yes, it is. But the earlier part of it, when I read it, I'm trying to get some clarity in it. I mean, it's a difficult thing to try to 
hard to find because nature treats these gradients in so many different ways. But I found that the early part of it was kind of confusing. The more I read it, the more I didn't understand it. I, I defer to the other commission members. So it is quite confusing, um, or I shouldn't say confusing, but technical. Uh, and these definitions mirror those definitions for canyons in the um, coastal zone, uh, specifically to provide that consistency between the coastal and the inland zones. Uh, we do have uh, provisions for inland canyons, but don't have them defined. And we would use the, this technical definition to define an inland canyon. What's not included in your proposal tonight, which we can add, is actually a figure to make that technical definition a bit easier to understand. That was probably, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Uh, Don. No, I agree with that. that uh, you know, like some sort of a graphical presentation with that. We had several issues like this several years ago up on Santiago and some of the other that were inland canyons. And I think Chris Wright, I think he's here, and I was part of the planner on that. And we, where well, we had no definition, but we were looking, we basically defined some of the edges. Uh, we try to conform and make it similar to what it is in the coastal zone, the string line and all that, as I recall. Maybe a little hazy ground right here, but actually try it because I remember some conformity to the, the edge of the canyon and the inland thing is it's similar to what it was just a fine forest similar to the by the, the coastal thing. I don't know if anybody remembers that we had several issues with some developments up in these inland canyons some time ago. And that is a five minute warning, Commissioner. Okay. Um, for canyon edge, do, do we have the same definition of canyon edge for both inland and coastal canyons, or are there def different definitions? Uh, we do not have any definitions for inland canyons. This would add them. But for the, these the, mirror those, these mirror okay. those uh, definitions for coastal. Oh, very good. So the, the, we have the same definition of a canyon edge between inland and coastal. Correct. Okay, great. This, this paragraph here is the same as what we have on the, in our land, coastal land use plan, the coastal commission. Correct. Okay. That's the case I'll back off on and reread it until I understand it. If we already have a definition for canning or and coastal canning, then England canning doesn't really need a definition. You can just say any canning that's not a coastal canning is an inland canning, and that's all. To clarify, uh, we have a definition for coastal canyon, but no definition for inland canyon or canyon. Any other comments on the Indian can inland canyon definition? No, I think that that's kind of like I think it's probably very similar to what we have in the coastal. It's just in a non-coastal area. So I'm comfortable with that. It's just the canyon edge paragraphs. The one that has some hard time with. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, three minutes left. Well, let's. Let's give us till the top of the hour um, to continue on this section because I think there's going to be some discussion with um, microbreweries and tap rooms um, given our history. Uh, so uh, I think it's important to kind of uh, 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 wrap that up so we can put a bow on this section. Um, is that the? Did you have something you wanted to talk about before that item, Jennifer, or would you? We want to go to the de the definitions you have under restaurants? Uh, I would suggest uh, talking about tap rooms with our remaining time. Thank you. All right, very good. Um, then, uh, uh, do you want to give us uh, like a very brief uh, motivation for this, like you have with the other ones? 
Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so this definition and the associated definitions would be added to the code to address an interpretation um, from the Planning Commission for microbreweries and from the city planner in regards to tap rooms. And this definition would mirror the recommendations uh, as far as staff uh, understood them in both of those interpretations. And we do have the city planner uh, on the phone call or at the meeting tonight uh, to help facilitate the, con the discussion if you have any questions. Commissioner, this is uh, Gabriel Fred, City Planner. So some background on this. You know, I know uh, we've talked about the interpretation for the tap rooms in the past, the standalone tap rooms. And um, so what we did present in here um, were ways that this could be integrated to the code if the Planning Commission, um, or based on the interpretation, right? So our interpretations should actually be included in the code but there is the opportunity for the plan commission um, to modify um, how that would reflect in the code or, um, you know, potentially it's, it's not included. Uh, and so there's definitely a lot of opportunity for discussion since I was part of that interpretation. Um, you know, I'm happy to, to help provide those options that are available to the plan commission. Uh, does anyone want to start off the conversation? I, I, I jump in. Okay. Uh, oh, Bart, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, we're here trying to make land use decisions, and it seems like we're not making a land use decision here. We're making a decision to... Um, implement something that I think was uh, not thought through when it was first approved. Um, so we're trying to fix a situation we're in and I'd like to know, one, how this is different than a wine tasting room uh, other than one's beer, one's wine. So why does there need to be a separate um, section? Um, and is this a land use that we feel is appropriate um, for our MU3 and MU1 zones, which are going to have residential elements, could be next to um, uh, hotel and apartment projects, and um, uh, I have no idea why allowing customers to carry in food for on-site consumption is even mentioned in here um, because if they do that then they're going to as far as I'm concerned they have to uh, provide parking just as if it was a they made it on site so uh, I'd like to hear somebody say that, yeah, I think we need this kind of land use in these zones. And then uh, if you can convince me of that, then we can, I'll make the next step. But I'm not sure this is a land use that's necessary in these zones. I, I kind of agree with you, Bart. I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's always the thing that I've struggled with this is what is the, what's the unique land use that we have to manage this? and. Hey Jim, we can hear your music. It's not my music, I don't think. I'm hearing it too. Excellent, excellent. Excellent. Hey, music. I don't know what that was, so anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, we also seem to be treating a tap room more like a restaurant, which... Uh, you know, I know they're only serving beer, but I know plenty of people who sit around and enjoy a few hours of uh, a beer. So um, uh, I, I don't really understand that either. It seems to be, I think, as Bart was saying, kind of like um, at best a distinction without a difference, or maybe trying to shoehorn a use in where it might not be ideal. I mean, a restaurant, well, you know. So anyway, well, sorry, go ahead, Mike. No, I, you know, I, 
I'm with you. There's a lot to say here. Um, so what's happened is we, we have, and, and this may be a matter of ease of, of you know, business, uh, uh, you know, starting a business, but w what we see with the microbreweries, you know, um, tasting rooms, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is, whether it be beer or hard spirits, um, there is, there's a light manufacturing component to these, and that's why, you know, it seems natural to, to have them up in the industrial zones, and in lighter industrial zones. You know, we've got a number of, of them here in town, but what's happened is, um, is that they've turned into more of a, um, into something different, really. You know, it, you know, we get the food trucks that are parked out on a, you know, regular basis out in front, you know, folks bringing food in, whatever it is, there's a food component. And so it, it makes sense to, to look at these the way we look at anything else. Um, you know, there are a number of uses in town where food and, and spirits are served. There may be an off-site location where, uh, you know, my microbrew um, uh, happens, but not on site. That's more of the retail side. You can go and get a sandwich and a beer that was made locally. That's great. It's in a commercial zone, which is characteristic. Uh, you know, it's used characteristic in that zone. But the BART's point, you know, we start, you know, bringing these in closer to more sensitive uses um, or inappropriate uses that you wouldn't, you know, put a bar in or, or a restaurant grill uh, you know, the bar and grill sort of thing, you know, it kind of begs the question, you know, what's so different about it really? I mean, the, the, it may look a little different, but, you know, the end result, you know, the function, the use itself really is about the same. You know, how the food is shaped and how it's delivered in or, you know, piped in, whatever it is, it's still functioning the same way. And it should be regulated, you know, like other uses. You know, I don't, to your point, Jim, I mean, to, to parse out these these uses um, this way, it, it gets to be complicated, and, and I think it's confusing, too. I mean, maybe for the operators, again, maybe an easier way to get up and running um, and offer some light fare for, for folks who are coming in to taste the product, and it does, in that sense, have a different look to it or characteristic, but at the end of the day, it's it's food and drinks, right? And so having a definition, we call it tap room, somebody else calls it a brew pub, you know, micro brew. I mean, there's so many different, if we can put all of these in the same, sort of in the same bucket with some exceptions here and there for things, uh, different, you know, different characteristics that may be atypical, then we address it then, but we have it in, in a category that we can easily reference. And then we, then we, adjust accordingly from there rather than have these completely separate islands of, of uses and people looking at each other and go, why, why do I got to go way over here to get language for that, you know, that regulation? Why am I looking in this different section of the code? Shouldn't it be here under, under the rest of them? So I agree. This, this might be a longer discussion than we have tonight. I think it's worthwhile, uh, to Bart's point, I think some Decisions may not have been the wrong decisions, but were decisions that were made in an effort to facilitate folks that wanted to, to do business in town. And as we often have done, uh, we find a way to accommodate folks that want to do business in town. And many of them have been great operators, and it's turned out well. They, they found great success, but it begs the question. You know, when we're talking about land use, you know, we should probably be, you know, adjusting this so we can have a better conversation in the future. And if it means an amendment, maybe some folks got in under the wire under a different code. Um, but that's what we're doing here. That's the point of this, right? To so, make it work better for everybody. So let me, um, I'll just put out uh, maybe some uh, a recommendation or some potential guidance for staff to chew on and people, you know, other commissioners can agree or disagree um, to see if we can maybe move forward with it. I'm looking at this, and I, the original interpretation by the Planning Commission, whenever that was, eight years ago or so, um, was that a, a microbrewery that just serves beer should be interpreted as a bar, and it should be, because it has a light industrial use there, you know, it, it, it could be in a commercial zone, but it needs a conditional use permit to make sure that we can 
properly condition it where that light industrial, that, that small industrial use is going to be appropriate. I would say as far as tap rooms are concerned, um, those are also bars. They are, they're just bars and we should treat them like, like that. Um, if you don't have food, then, you know, you're not a restaurant. Um, I, I think that would be roughly the same as a, as a, as a wine tasting room. Um, and again, probably just in commercial zones and, and not mixed use zones because you've got neighbor, potentially neighborhoods there in mixed use zones that might be more negatively impacted. So microbreweries, yeah, I, I would say just throw out the tap room definition. Keep microbreweries as something that requires a conditional use permit, you know, small batch microbreweries that has a conditional use permit in neighborhood con con uh, commercial zones. And we could actually have a definition of tap room, but say it's a bar or modify the definition of a bar to say this includes a, you know, a tap room, any facility that is only serving, it doesn't cook any food, it doesn't prepare any food, and it only serves alcohol of whatever kind. So I'll just throw, put that out there and see what people think. I guess I could uh, probably get my hands around that, Tim. The microbrewery, uh, I, I look at this particular definition, we just approved one down in Los Molinos, it does have an industrial uh, wedge to it, part of it, part of the business is making it there. Uh, and so I'm comfortable with Michael Bloom. The tap room basically is, is just defining defi the artifacts annex, so to speak, that is underneath the, that we had a big brew hall over on some definitions here. And it's, uh, and what it says here is that another thing is that it's under the ownership of approved Michael Burley operating in, in San Clemente and then E, is the only standalone beer tasting room permitted for the microbrewery in item D. In other words, I think Artifacts actually had a tasting room at their main place. They just wanted an annex downtown. So E is very restricted com compared to most of the other little breweries along here. So I kind of tend to agree with Jim that, uh, you know, one is Los Meninos Beer Company and one is Artifacts if you want to look at it from recent activity. And the tap room one, uh, whether you can bring your food in or bring it on set, that describes their business plan. Do we need a definition for that? I guess. Uh, yeah, except to say maybe that you know, in the definition of bars, we could we could describe a tap room, or if the de in the definition of tap room, say it's a bar. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, um, and I, I, yeah, and I, yeah, I guess I can't remember if I said it or not. But microbreweries, because of their industrial nature, we may not want in mixed use areas at all. You know, can make them conditional in commercial areas, but not mixed use areas at all. But okay, Jim, if I may interject, just keep mm -hmm. in mind. The granddaddy of them all, at least here in SoCal, okay, and that's BJ's. Um, uh, was it pizza? Mm -hmm. uh, they they did have when they first came out into market. They did have a, a small, very you know ornate. It was more. I don't know if, it, if they were doing some micro brewing brewing on site. And their primary function was was food, but there it was in the name. You know, BJ's. Uh, I, I, does anybody recall the, the official name of that? But you all know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah. So, so but that's yeah, what they did. Yeah. It's, it's a good point. I mean, one thing we didn't talk about here was what if it's a microbrewery that's serving food? Now it looks more like a restaurant. How should we treat that? And, you know, if they do actually prepare food, you know, serving sandwiches I don't think is preparing food. It's like you don't have a kitchen. You know, you don't cook something. Right. Um, so, and, and there, and we do have definitions for that to make that distinction. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe you want, we want to restrict or allow based on also whether they use food. And my biggest concern in that case is just the, the fact they're doing a small industrial stuff and should be conditioned to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the neighborhood since it's a, you know, since that part's not, um, an obvious compatible use. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think um, we're pretty much on the same page. Um, in my view, viewpoint, um, micro brewery, brewery, tap room, um, they're all bar. And by the way, we don't have a definition for pub. We mentioned a pub somewhere, we don't have a definition for it. 
If we want to expand the definition of bar, we can do a sub-definition underneath the bar, but I don't think they're necessary. ABC, Alcoholic Beverage Control, has a, a clear definition between a distinction between restaurants and a bars. A bar is primary for the sale of uh, alcoholic beverage. Restaurants, on the other hand, is for serving meal. Restaurant may have a, a alcoholic license, may have a bar or not. A bar may serve food or not, but um, they have the defining character is if they're, whether they're selling meals or, or, or alcoholic beverage um, as their primary source of the revenue. Um, bar has a um, bar is quite a different from a restaurant because um, in order to, to go to a bar, people need to be 21 years and older. I cannot bring my child to a bar. I can go to a restaurant. So they do serve the public, but they serve uh, a smaller uh, subset of the public. And I think they're different land use. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I do not agree that we put a bar underneath the restaurant. They are different. And a bar is associated with uh, quite a few negative uh, impact to the neighborhood. To name a few, noise, parking, security uh, concerns, you know, people have fight there. Um, all these things um, make the bar a little more less desired than restaurants. Uh, do we really want to put the bar underneath the definition, underneath the umbrella of a restaurant to allow them to enjoy the benefits and incentive you know, the city designed to encourage restaurants, uh, you know, most, most importantly, the parking waivers? Um, I'm not for um, encouraging alcoholic consumption in the city. And I think if a restaurant have a bar, and that, that's, that's, that's fine. To, to, for them to have that outdoor seating waiver for the parking. But if there's a bar and they don't serve any food, um, the, you know, what the reason to, to let them to have the parking waiver? And that because the result will be there will be more of them and they're going to create some negative impact to the neighborhood. So that's something we need to carefully think about. And also, okay. in this definition, we try to put some uh, development standards in this definition. I, I believe they should belong, they, they should go to um, the, the development standard underneath the, uh, the respective zones, not in the, in the definition. Um, otherwise, people go to, could go to each zone and look up development standards, and then later on, they found that that's not all, because something the definition also governs. That, that's not very uh, clear and friendly to people. So I would recommend that if we are changing any development standards, we address them in development standards underneath the zone, land use zones, not in definition. And, and the fact that if we were to put a bar underneath the um, the restaurant definition, we're effectively changing the development standard, standards, and that needs to be um, needs to be notified to the public. That's a bigger bigger issue than changing a definition. Changing a definition is a sneaky way to 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 make to effectively change that development standards. I think we need a, 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 a open public discourse on that if we want to um, allow. Um, uh, if we want to make a bar part of the restaurant definition. So um, we are, we've got about 50 minutes left. Um, if uh, the commissioners feel like we've provided staff sufficient input here, and if staff doesn't have any questions for us, um, then we could move on from this item. But if staff move under the definition of a bar, then we can move on. So Jennifer, you, do you have, uh, you probably do have enough from us on this uh, item right now? We do. Thank you. We will make it a separate item and bring it back at a later date. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, Jennifer, it's up to you uh, if there's anything else you wanted to cover in this section or if you'd like to go to the next section. Chairman Roland, I was, I was yes. going to ask if if you could, um, some of the plan commissioners can weigh on at least one thing. It has to do with what Commissioner Wu brought up. Uh, the reason why bars and cocktail lounge um, is under restaurants and in this code amendment is that 
one, bar and cocktail lounge isn't defined in the code. And then two, in the plan commission interpretation for microbreweries in 2000, the 2012, um, in that interpretation, uh, it identified a bar and a cocktail lounge as a subset of a restaurant. Um, and it made it through that interpretation. And so, uh, you know, if the plan commission doesn't feel that a bar or a cocktail lounge would be under a restaurant, um, and then, you know, I, I would be interested to know if, if there's other plan commissioners that, um, you know, think so as well. Because I think that changes a lot of what we'll present to the plan commission in a public hearing. Okay. Well, I, if I may, I, you know, bars and cocktail lounges, okay, this is, and don't hit me with a stick when I say this. These, these are terms that have been grandfathered in. You know, microbreweries, tap rooms, all that didn't exist. You know, so when language was created and standardized, it was used across the board. Everybody, everybody used the same sort of um, terms to identify a particular behavior and land, land use. So a lounge and a bar are basically places to drink alcohol. Okay, and so. This definitely warrants more discussion, but I think you know we have an opportunity to bring our language up to date, to modernize, to just make it current to today's you know living. You know, restaurants don't really build the same way they used to. You know, you, you, some of the older restaurants you walk in, there's a little separate lounge off to the side to go over there, and now everything's kind of out in the open, and you know they may have a, a you know a a bar, if you will, like a physical bar, but it's right there, you know, right? The tables are nearby. It's just kind of... So, I guess what, I, what I'm saying is, Gabriel, my, my thoughts on that are, you know, that there definitely needs to be more discussion here, certainly more than, you know, we have time for tonight. But I think it's an opportunity to true it up, just like we can with parking. That's another big one that we can talk about. So, just to make our, our code language more current, you know, and applicable to how we live now, you know, how people use space. So. so, Mike, if I understand what you're saying, like a definition of a restaurant would have to include the fact that it serves alcohol, and the definition of a bar would have to say it doesn't include food, as opposed to yeah. like a parent-child type of relationship between the two. Do I have that right? right? Yeah, I think, you know, it would... We're going to need to do some research and know where we draw the line, so how we scale. So, you know, at some point on that sliding scale, it shifts. You know, there's it's more of a restaurant with a, you know, that serves alcohol. They have a, you know, they've got their ABC license and they're serving beer and wine or maybe hard spirits uh, versus, you know, it's, it's kind of primary versus ancillary in uses. So if you, you know, we've got a number of establishments in town where you walk in, you know you're in a bar. First thing you see is a gigantic bar, some pool tables and some taps, and you know you're in a bar. They may sell, you know, some you know, pots, you know, sliders or whatever off the side, but that's those are the ancillary to the primary. The primary being the bar. So that, you know, that would be under the definition of however we draft this, so we wordsmith all this, and so everything kind of falls if it on that scale, you know, something that's easy for our city planner to say that's definitely a, a bar by our criteria. You know, you're a bar with a food component um, versus you are a restaurant. It's you know, you open open seating. You've got a hostess or host that, that'll invite you in with the family, sit down, um, and you can also have a beer if you like with your meal. We happen to have you know, the restaurant has maybe a, some taps. Maybe you know, it does have a little bar off the side, but it's clearly not you know primary to the to the. You know, it's not a primary component to the use. More so, so, so to address. Hey, Gabriel's question. Um, it sounds like what I'm hearing, and people can correct me, is there are we, we'd like you'd like to see maybe something that has has definitions for a restaurant as separate from bar, as separate from etc. That says essentially in a restaurant the primary thing is food. They might do alcohol too, and in a bar the primary thing is alcohol. Maybe they do a little food too, et cetera, et cetera. And 
you know, kind of enumerate the things like that. Does that sound like the the kind of uh, guidance we want to give the staff? Yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah, that's okay. definitely ABC now. So it's all good. Okay, Gabriel, do you have what you need then? Did that, did, did, we, did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. And for the remaining time that we have until 7 o'clock, um, I'd like to in reintroduce Christopher Wright uh, to discuss the uh, non-conforming provision. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening. Good evening. Christopher Wright. Associate Planner too. Uh, my uh, subject area relates to non-conforming structures and uses, clarifying six items that are on page 28 of your 28 attachment six of your report. Uh, the first, I'm going to go through them one by one because they're they're items in which you may have questions, and I think it will aid the discussion to go through one by one. So first, it, there's an item to clarify the 50% rule for detached garages and garage expansions. Uh, as a reminder, the 50% rule is how additions and alterations are measured for non-conforming structures, the cutoff point in which a structure must be made conforming. For additions, currently an addition is based upon the gross floor area of a structure. And gross floor area is to the outer limits of that building. So if you have a garage that's attached, the garage is currently counted in the size of the structure in which you can expand less than 50%. So if you have a garage that's attached, you potentially could expand more area than if you have a detached garage. And the uh, Planning Commission, we had a, an interpretation in which some direction was given to make changes so that the 50% rule is primarily based upon the living area of the home, but that there would also be some provisions for garage additions that comply with the code, uh, with the focus on making it where garages are treated the same, whether they be attached or detached. So several changes are proposed. Uh, first, there are some strike through edits to remove distinguished uh, standards for detached and attached. The, the size of a dwelling would be based upon living area. For accessory buildings like garages, it would be based on the, the interior area of the building to the outer most walls of the garage or the, the accessory structure. And then for any non-residential building, it would be based upon gross floor area like it is today. Uh, that, that concludes my overview of that. The, it's really the first two items um, are related to the, that discussion. Are there any questions? No, it makes sense to me. Nope. No, seeing none, I'll keep uh, going. Chris, 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 okay. You're going to keep going. You're, so you're going to get deeper into the non-conforming accessory piece. You're just working through. I think I lost you. Did you say you were just on page 28? Page I'm 20? on page... I'm sorry. Okay. I lost you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you. I apologize, but I, I'm not clear on what you just... Address. You're just addressing page 28? 28 and 29. They're the first two items. Okay. Subject area. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I, know I, I would mean. like to try to go through the items as we go. So if you have any comments or questions, uh, I would welcome them now so we can try to get through them. We can always come back if you have more questions. Okay. Okay. So on page 29, 
The third item is related to parking required for multifamily expansions. There were some city council comments over time raising a question of whether the city should allow additions to multifamily residential structures that have nonconforming parking um, without them bringing parking into compliance with parking standards. So even if it's less than a 50% addition. And staff does not recommend changes for this item because of concerns that it would be an uh, obstacle to improving housing and with some housing units being occupied by more than one family and providing uh, options for people of varying incomes, uh, staff does not recommend changes. Are there any concerns with this item? Nope, doesn't sound like it. Okay. The fourth item is an exemption for residences with single car garages or carports prior to April 4th, 1962. Our zoning ordinance nonconforming chapter exempts residences with a single car garage or carport built prior to April 4th, 1962. It does not speak to what, whether that exemption applies if someone were to completely tear the house down. So uh, staff's Understanding is the intent is not to maintain that exemption as someone is making significant changes to a house. So we are proposing changes that would say if you are removing portions of the structural frame of that house and the changes are 100% or more of the replacement value of the house, then that exemption would no longer apply. Any questions? Yeah, this, this gets into a question that I had because I saw in a few places we seem to be, at least to my eyes, this is, this is kind of a new thing. We've usually done like 50% square footage or something like that. We're now saying for some of these items that that uh, bar is the replacement cost, 50% or 100% replacement cost. Right. How do you calculate that? Yes, yeah, so I on, uh, first I, I do want to note that the idea of replacement costs as a threshold for applying nonconforming rules actually exists when it comes to accident damage for nonconforming uses. And so we are taking that same idea and text and just applying it for some unique circumstances in which it can be difficult to, in staff's opinion, to cover different circumstances that could come up for people and, and more complexity in how you may measure something. Um, and, and, I'll, and that will make sense when I get to the next item. But it, why don't we turn to, uh, let's see here, just a second. Hey, 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 Jim. I um, I'd like to comment on on your comment as well, and Chris, while you're looking for that section, I um, I think that's uh, Jim's comment is valid because it, it, if if y'all recall our discussion on pole signs, um, we had a lot of uh, discussion on you know at what point does a uh, a legally non-conforming uh, sign need to come down. And those that are in, those that made it under the wire, they're in and they're, they're going to stay. Uh, you know, and will they ever come down? And so, and Chris was part of the team at that time and we did have lots of discussion on how we determine, you know, what is, um, you know, uh, at what degree of, of change, at what point do we say, well, now that's, that's too much and, you know, it's, you're going to have to meet the current, uh, you know, uh, development standards, uh, and as such, you can't have it. You basically have to take it down if it's, and that was 50%. And that was on a physical component. So any structural reinforcement work that needed to be done, you know, anything that was considered to be 50%, even that was scary to me because that becomes an interpretation because 
you know, with all due respect to to Gabriel, our city planner, it was it was really a determination was made um, outside of the of um, you know of the public arena, if you will. Not that you know what we do at City Hall outside of what Planning Commission does is not within the public you know purview, but it's a different character. So there's no plan. There's no you know. Uh, public hearing, there's no noticing that goes out, and folks just pretty much don't know what's happening unless they're paying attention, which they have a right to do. So that threshold is 50%. So, and, and now to your point, Jim, you know, when we're in, in maybe the section Chris is looking for, um, and it's in the packet, it talks about, you know, city planner has discretion, they have full discretion over that, and that's great. We trust in our, in our city you know, planning department. Um, but it's really a matter of, well, the developer comes in and says, well, my replacement cost is less than 50%. And the city planner says, okay. Uh, says who? Well, my knowledge says differently, so we're going to go to a third party, and that, that is also defined in the packet here that that is at the discretion of our city planner to call for a third party evaluation on the actual replacement cost. But what if that replacement cost is still less than 50%, yet the physical change is more than 50%, and we've lost that. So I'm just I'm just kind of throwing this out there. It's very rough and crude, and I apologize, but in terms of continuity in our language throughout when it comes to non-conforming structures, whether it be, you know, in the residential, commercial, industrial zone, it should, there should be consistency there. And I am, you know, I am also concerned with just hanging it on replacement value, though, Chris is, you know, he's right. It comes down to, you know, if something is insured, you know, what's that, you know, how is that replacement cost determined, you know, is it, so, but for us, it's a land use. We're talking about setbacks, height, you know, the appearance of something, the aesthetics, that's what we're talking about. The cost of it is a little different animal uh, for us that are talking about land use, so it's an important piece of it it's a little different than what we're used to because we're dealing with the sides of a structure, all of them. And so if you're going to take away 50% of it or you have to add 50% more to it, that's when we're more, most interested. What that cost is, it may vary. You may get a contractor that's licensed that says, hey, I'm going to do it for I'm going to do it for free. This is my first project and I'm just going to do it as a loss leader and I'm going to do it for nothing. And suddenly your average is skewed, right? So that's what I have to say to that. And Chris, sorry to, to interrupt, but I just wanted to add that in because I think it's important. Jim's point to me is valid. Okay, thank you. And so on page 51, there are requirements that exist today for non-conforming uses when there's an accident. And at what point does a non-conforming use like a, a duplex in a single family residential neighborhood have to be brought into compliance. And uh, there are provisions already for replacement costs that would be the property owner's responsibility to provide a written analysis that would be done by professional uh, an experienced and qualified construction cost estimator. And uh, it says, according to con existing construction cost estimating indices to the approval of city planner, and then it would be a city planner determination with the option to do a third party review if necessary at the applicant's cost. The idea in this language came about through consulting with our building official at the time with the idea that this is how we assess fees for building permits. And so I was, when this text is put together at the time, we, our prior non-conforming ordinance also had the idea of replacement costs. And changes were made in 2008 to improve the language with consultation with building staff. And the idea is we calculate fees based upon replacement costs. And the building official routinely reviews what the valuation is according to indices and using that same idea to, to apply non-conforming regulations when it can be more, I, I think, tricky to deal with a particular situation. 
So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, accident damage for a, a structure can mean changes to the roof. It can mean damage to the walls. It can mean damage to the foundation. Uh, and so it can be all-encompassing. And so that's why it, it, I think in the case of accident damage, it was used. Well, why staff is proposing it now is because for a garage, um, a single family residence with a single car garage, a lot of these garages are in the back of the property. And previously this issue has come up before on whether we should not exempt these buildings. At one point should we not do it? And there was public concern about, about the complexity of adding a parking space if a garage is in the back of the property. And so there was extra emphasis put into this idea staff had of, of using replacement costs, setting it 100%. So you have to, like, you're doing 100% uh, value type of project of the house, that that would be the point in which you would have to add a parking space or change the parking. So if replacement cost is not desired for the situation, then uh, I have another idea. But with that explanation, can I get some further discussion and guidance on this? Chris, I would just say it's all about intensification and degrees thereof, right? So you know, replacement cost, it's important and it should be factored in, especially when it comes to fees. Okay, maybe that's that's a useful piece of it. I just I'm thinking about intensification. If we're if we're intensifying something, um, you know I'm just hung up on anything that was legally non conforming that experiences some sort of expansion. But you know, we're, we're weighing that against how much it's going to cost to do it. <sighs> you know, having knowledge of construction costs, I mean, we have standards, right? But uh, again, you know, I, I know a couple GCs that are new, they're new at it, and they're doing work for free, basically. I mean, maybe they get materials for half as much, and, you know, maybe they're willing to do it, you know, at a reduced labor cost. I mean, so we start to, that's a slippery slope. It really is because if, if a contractor comes in or a developer comes in and says, well, I, I want to do X, Y, Z, and this is our valuation, and the city looks in, in their you know their standards book and, and sees that you know they look at all the lines and they come up with a different number, I think that's an argument. You know, you know maybe the developer says, well, you can't tell me what I get. You know these air conditioners for, you know, I get them for pennies on the dollar. You know, my brother owns a, a manufacturing plant and I get them for cost. You know, I'm not paying $4,000 a unit. I'm paying, you know, $400 a unit. You know, and suddenly it becomes a, an argument. But meanwhile, you know, they're putting in 10,000 air conditioning units on a rooftop and increasing the height of that building by four feet. And <laughs> I mean, this is a horrible example. I apologize. But my point is, you know, if we're intensifying use, um, you know, for those of us here, we're looking at the spatial, we're looking at the, the envelope, you know, how much bigger is it going to be, you know, does it meet, do we, pole signs, for example, do we allow them anymore? No, we don't. If they're next to the freeway, you can't put one in. But if you're going to add to it, we're, are we going to use, you know, the value of the addition to determine whether or not there's been a, uh, you know, that threshold has been breached? And then suddenly it's, you know, it triggers a, you know, you know, something that requires it to meet the development standards that are current because of the value that the developer says it has or even a third party says it has, regardless of what the intensification looks like physically. Uh, so, so you guys, you, I'm sorry, Chris. Can I just... Can I just say that the code changes that are proposed are on page 40, so we can actually see what's proposed? Our, our goal here, to step back for a moment, as where people are, flip, are flipping to that, our goal here ultimately is to take something that is, at, at some point, take something that's significantly out of conformance and bring it into conformance. Right? You got some place that was built 60, 70 years ago, got a little one-car garage or something back there. And at some point, 
they've got to get sufficient parking. They've been grandfathered in for, well, since my grandfather's day, right? <laughs> and at some point, the goal is to bring them into compliance. We're not trying to, like, push them off a cliff or anything, but at some point, come into compliance. You're talking about homes here that are at least 60 years old. And we're doing kind of, it sounds to me like, and people can correct my thinking, we're kind of doing these flips and twists to get an estimate of what it will cost. So that, and based on that estimate, if it's over or under a certain amount, they've got to bring the garage into conformance or not. A garage has been out of conformance for many decades. So, and people are going to play with those numbers, right? They're going to get the right contractor. The contractor's going to, like, you know, do an estimate. And, of course, there'll be big cost overruns to get to the actual cost. But that low initial estimate will get them to the number they need. And I'm just wondering if we're if we're trying to do too much here at this point. This is specifically for houses built before 1962. So, at some point, can we get – why can't, at this point, we – pick some very subjective, excuse me, very objective, simple measure. You know, maybe it's a pretty low bar. You do any change. You do a 10% change. You know, you do a change that requires a permit of more than $300. Some objective measurement like that and say, oh, okay, now you have to bring that into conformance. It's 60, 70 years old. So that's kind of my question is, is we seem to be doing a lot of work here and, and kind of have, leaving a, a, the door wide open to people, you know, kind of jiggering the system to avoid coming into conformance, why don't we just make it so that people need to come into conformance at this point and kind of make a very simple rule with a fairly low bar if we want? Well, if if that's uh, what the commission's position is, then I would suggest for this situation to say that the existing rules for uh, removal of an exterior frame or alt ex major alterations to the frame would apply here, but I think we need to we need to decide what the the percent threshold should be. Should it be a 50 percent threshold like any other non-conforming structure? Because right now it, it's exempt from those rules, and so staff was leaning towards being more generous for these older homes and does that does that mean we're okay with uh, say say we were to change this text and say unless a project uh, removes portions of the dwelling structure uh, removes or um, involves major alterations of the dwelling structural frame according to the other rules that in the chapter that ex that are a hundred percent or up a hundred percent you know what what's that percentage that the commission supports well if I may make another another comment if we're going to to Chris if we're going to do this is it too much that we just have continuity across the board? I realize we're talking about a specific, um, you know, type of use here, but I'm just looking for for continuity throughout our code when we're talking about non-conforming uses. And if if there is so 50% is the number that it's been we've been talking about that number since I've been around and, and maybe you know, others that have been around longer than I, including Chris and Bart, uh, Jim, and, uh, and Don, you know, 50% seems to be the number. And if we can do sort of a, maybe a survey, I've seen it in other jurisdictions as well, maybe we just pick that number. And exceptions are part of the process. It's part of our function as a group here, and we look at exceptions. So if, if we're talking about you know, one use versus another. If you have a residential use that is doing some sort of expansion, um, you know, valuation aside, it comes to us if there's a if there is some sort of a um, you know maybe it's sixty percent. So if there's a you know public hearing, we talk about it, and then we do it on a case by case basis basis and consider impacts and, and all these things, just like any other project. But 
I, I really do think we should have a, a standard across the board for all non-conforming. Uh, I understand where you're coming from. I think the reason why this situation has been set aside in the past, there's been public concern before about setting a limit on additions, and uh, so I was very careful with this one. Uh, I think it's this idea that a bunch of these older buildings with these one-car garages, they're in the back of the property. And so changes to the residence, uh, the 50% 50, 50 may not be enough. You know, I, I, I don't really know. You know, I'm just theorizing here based upon the idea of where this exemption came from. Uh, the idea was that it would be too problematic, too, too burdensome for someone with a single family garage, single residence built that long mm -hmm. ago with a garage in the back to add a parking space. So if if that's the situation, then maybe we do that. Maybe we have exceptions. So the, uh, the big thing that I, I've never agreed with this exemption on is that you could tear down the house right now. Yeah. And you can have the exemption again. So that's yeah. what I was focused on. I agree with that. Chris, but then uh, how do you measure that? That's that's the challenge. Is, right. is that oh. exterior walls? Is that alterations? Uh, that, <laughs> that's I, I, there's a couple. Okay, I'm, I'm going to throw out a couple things. Uh, I, I happen to know that, um, and maybe... Uh, Barton and, and Zen have done work in the city of Claremont. Claremont has a pretty clear rule on this and when it comes to this sort of use and expansions. And you know, maybe we can look at that. You know, maybe there's somebody on, on the call from the planning department that has familiar, familiarity with this as well. So maybe we start there. All I'm, all I'm saying is we, we, need, we, need a, we need something to draw from. So it's not just willy-nilly. Every project is looked at differently, and that's fine, but we have to have standards that we can, you know, go to. And then from there, if there's an exception needed, then we talk about it. Okay. I, asked that, so, oh, I think I got enough feedback. I ask that we keep moving because we have a couple <laughs> other items. Trying to come up with here is to get away from the walls and all that stuff. You just go to that 50 percent rule and make it clear and concise and simple for the the guys at the counter and everything else trying to work the everyday business. So that's why I think it's a good move. And I, I understand you want to move on, Chris, but I, I'm still a little at a loss as to what we're going for here, right? These, these houses are older. You know, if they're a historic house, then they're going to stay right the way they are, you know, period. But are we saying that these should be in compliance or not? And if they need a lot of work to get into compliance, is that is that the is that what we want to see in the city, or is what we want to see is these you know houses, some of them very quaint, some of them a little run down, that they can remain, and in which case we want to make it as as kind of as liberal as possible and say you know, you don't have to update it at all. I'm just I'm not I, I just I'm I kind of hear different things. It's you know you usually we want to bring people into compliance, but are we saying we want to keep these the way they are? Do we want to say we want to bring them in compliance? Do we want to say we want, want to make them historic structures? Because you know, some of them could be historic structures now, in which case they would be preserved, you know, except for the ones that maybe don't fit, fit the bill of historic structure. So uh, that, you know, we can talk a lot about what we can do, but what we do do is going to drive some, some, you know, some behavior in the city. It's going to drive some outcome in the city. I want to make sure we're hitting the right outcome, and maybe I'm missing it here. Maybe maybe everybody knows but me, and everyone everyone gets it but me. But you know, I keep asking, what do we want to see here with these kinds of homes? Do we want to preserve them? Do we want to move them on to something else? Uh, I'd like to hear on, on the commissioners on that. An accessory uh, dwelling type issue here for structures to the only things, and what he's trying to do is get away with the. the the problems of how you calculate it with walls and decks and interior, outer, and he just said, okay, 
set a percentage of the change of the structure, and beyond that, you've got to bring it all up to code. And so what you set here is 50% of the value. And it kind of gets away from all the determinations of interior walls, exterior walls, uh, of an access accessory structure. So, so tell me, let me, uh, let me, let me pause you at the pause button just for a moment. So maybe you or Chris could tell me if we do that, if we if we put that in and say fifty percent of the cost of it, what's going to happen? Well, what would we expect to happen in general with these kinds of structures? And is that what we want to see in the city? Can I can I address that? I think it comes down to a, a simple question that that I keep coming back to. Should people be able to completely tear down a quaint house that is a part of a neighborhood that was built 50, 60 years ago with a single car garage? Should they be able to take a bulldozer and run it over and be able to keep a single car garage? I, to me, the answer is no. You bulldoze it down, you get, you're starting over. Right. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump in real quick um, and kind of go with Chris. Um, if somebody takes one of these houses, bulldozes it down, builds a new house, has the neighborhood's parking issues affected at all? No. It's a single family house, it's a single car garage, just like it, it has been for 60 years. Um, it's almost like having a um, an exemption from the parking requirement on that lot. Does it hurt the neighborhood? It'd be nice to have the extra parking space. If it's in the rear, uh, they've got a longer driveway than anybody with a truck-loading garage and can stack three, four cars in there. Um, what's the impact of the neighborhood? That's what we've got to focus on and uh, determine. Is there one? Is it negative? Um, or is it actually something um, that we're doing that won't allow these to be remodeled and hurts the neighborhood over the long run by keeping these old houses that may or may not be maintained? So... Um, I mean, the state's already shown us that, that they don't care about parking uh, on property. I mean, the same house could have a, a ADU um, and not provide any additional parking. That impacts the neighborhood more than anybody going to have the one-car garage. So yeah. we need to make that land use decision rather than worrying about all this little stuff. And once we make that decision, then we craft this uh, the ordinance accordingly. And uh, Chris, would you say it's a huge negative impact uh, to a neighborhood if these um, lots are allowed to maintain their non-conforming garage and still uh, still just basically rebuild a single-family house? I think considering that some homes are occupied by more than one family, if someone were to tear down a house and enlarge the house and may potentially have more occupant, having more parking could be a good thing. But I think that's kind of a side issue for me. I, I think part of this comes down to fairness. If I am building a brand new property, I need to have two car garage. If I have a property that was built 60 years ago and I have a single car garage, I can continue to have a single car garage indefinitely. At what point does the city think it's fair to require everybody to be treated the same? That that's a, it's a non-conforming ordinances are tricky city to city because it 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 only is based upon what is fair. Now, at what point is it fair to make somebody follow the rules that somebody else has already had to follow? Well, you know what, Chris? That is, a, in the planning world, that has been a, a discussion that's gone on since the beginning of time. 
So if I may, I'll make a comment about this. If a developer is going to come, if, a, if somebody's going to come in and purchase a property, and they see a loophole in, in our code, uh, they've got a detached single car garage, and they're going to demo the whole house and think that they can, you know, get away with, um, you know, just putting re remaining uh, uh, with just one car. To me, that yeah, it's a discussion about fairness. But somebody's trying to kind of cheat the system, but it's, is it really cheating the system if our code allows it? That's why when we make changes like this, when we have discussions like this, there should be visibility to all parts, because every little standard we have connects to another. And if we have continuity throughout our development code, then we have protections in place. So if, if we change the rule to say, well, if you come in and you demolish the primary structure on the property being the house itself and you've got an ancillary component uh, the single car garage you shouldn't be able you should we should see that different we should look at that differently it shouldn't be a loophole you should now because you've removed the primary structure on the property just because you left up left the uh, you know the, the single car garage there you shouldn't be allowed to build a new Magnificent structure on there, and still have just the one car garage, and the requirement for just one car. That's the burden that falls on the developer. It shouldn't be a loophole. That's where I think there's there's a there's a problem. And I'll 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 take a look at what other cities do. I'll I'll just say that my work on this goes back to the one wall standing issue. Right. That's that what prompted the rewriting of the non-conforming ordinance. Someone kept the wall up, and then they didn't. They said that nope, my home is not torn down. There is one wall. Okay, uh, and the primary structure. And they can structure. get a little trick. What's that? Of uh, a primary structure. That's what we need to find out, and then we need to have a discussion about it. Because I think that I think that's valid, Chris. The one wall. Yeah, that's been going on for years. Absolutely. But if, if somebody's going to walk, walk into a neighborhood that has a certain character and scale and demo the, you know, the little you know, bungalow that's there and shoehorn a gigantic box in there that goes from property line to property line and keeps a single car garage and puts some lipstick on it, and suddenly you know, they've kind of, you know, they found a loophole. And it should be the primary, it should be the primary use on the property. One wall, if they leave that up, you know, you can work with that. But if they're going to leave a shed on the property and think that they can, you know, not, uh, you know, adhere to the development standards for new development, that's a new project. It's clearly a new project. So I think it's worthy of discussion. We've got to protect okay, our Yeah, I'll have to come back. Yeah. So let me, let me jump in. I, I, I'll make it short. Okay. Uh, I'm with you if someone uh, has a single car garage in the backyard. By the way, the exemption also applies to people who have a single car garage in the front, right? So if someone wants to uh, uh, demolish the whole house and, and, and build a, a much larger home, and the occupants um, very likely will be increased and there will be more traffic. So in that case, uh, we should bring that into um, compliance. But uh, my my little issue with your proposal language is that it's not friendly to a homeowner. At the very beginning, people have no way to know if they're going to um, hit that 100% uh, threshold if you use value. Well, there are two values that we need to calculate. And the first one is the replacement cost of the existing house. The second value is the the, the estimated value of the improvement. Unless those numbers are published by our building department in a very simple way, then people need to jump into a hoop and they need to design to a certain point so they can hire some estimator to get an idea whether they will be, will be required to add a second parking or not. And that's not that's not good. I, 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 like the, I like homeowners or people to know at the very beginning uh, whether they would be required to have a second parking space or not. So either we have a very simple method of evaluation 
of existing house and the, the, enha the improvements. Or we just use uh, some simpler metric uh, such as the floor space. Okay, I'll have to come back to this one. I'll think about it. Uh, oh, Commissioner, we are you still? I think I have a delay on my. Are you I'm, still? I'm still here. Oh, okay, are you done commenting? I'm done. Okay. Uh, so the next item relates to demolition of accessory structures and when they should be brought into compliance. Uh, I also was suggesting replacement cost. In this case, I, I have a stronger opinion about it because of all the complexities that go on with accessory structures. You're talking about walls, decks, patio covers, um, arbors, gazebos. They're all different. So to have, I, I, I'm not seeing a a common way to measure them. Like some do we measure by area, some do we measure by by linear footage. That that's that's what I was not I wasn't seeing an easy way to do that. So that's why I left with replacement costs. Are there any concerns or comments about this? My comments the same. Really, it's just we need to find, uh, you know, we need to find that way to to measure that area. You know, I think that's because that that's something that we can do. We can measure the area if it's square inches, square feet, whatever it is. Um, it seems to be a more logical approach to, to this, it, just from my perspective. The replacement cost. Chris, help me here. I feel like we're 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 delving into an area that's outside of our purview. You know what it costs to replace something um, changes from person to person. You know, evaluator to evaluator. But the physical, you know, characteristics of something are something that you know, we you know we look at as as a commission. We look at we look at height. You know size, FAR, all of that stuff is, you know, what we're most interested in. So it's a it's a tough one. Well, I'm going to jump in. As, as long as a value is published and the building department has them for home construction, they say, you know, it's going to be, est all houses are going to be estimated 125 miles a foot, whatever uh, is established for new construction. Um, it could be done the same as uh, um, Chris has mentioned here, and if it was published, and it doesn't matter if it's a realistic number, as long as it's in proportion to each of the um, types, you know, that a, an arbor is one-third the cost of a uh, the second floor deck. It doesn't matter if it's a realistic number or not, as long as the proportion's right. Um, I think the replacement cost is a, a viable way of going. Well, if we have that, if we have that in, in play, and that is current, kept up to date. Well, it doesn't even have to be a current number, as long as the proportion is right. In other words, yeah, some guy may be able to um, get his arbor built for 25 bucks a foot. But if it's established that we're going to base this um, uh, analysis on 100 bucks a foot, it's going to be on 100 bucks a foot. It has nothing to do with what the actual cost of the work is, and that's how they do building permits. Yeah, I can build a bungalow for a you know 100 bucks a foot and a mansion for 400 bucks a foot, but the building code. Is going to evaluate my permit fee at one number. I understand, Bart. With and with all due respect, I, I, I appreciate that. But the thing is, when we're talking about permit fees versus you know land use, we're talking about again you know physical characteristics of, of something. 
you know, its height, width, setbacks, all of these things, you know, we have to have some sort of a gauge. And if that's the way we're going to do it, I don't know. I, it's just, to me, it's always been, it's been just ripe for, for error because of, you know, lumber costs and copper costs and steel, all these things that fluctuate, but we don't always see, uh, you know, a, a, an update to, to those published standards. We don't see that. Sometimes it's... But you know, I, I guess what I'm coming at is if a guy wants to build a stick-built house with uh, flatboard siding and a composition roof, and another guy wants to build the exact same thing with um, uh, mahogany and a copper roof, should they be different? No. Should they pay differently? No. Not because one guy's using nice materials and the other guy's not. Uh, it should be on the size of the structure. What the percent of I would agree. I think uh, I, I would uh, support the value approach if we have a published schedule. For example, the baseline number it would be for a enclosed space per square foot, whatever that number is. And the building department can update it annually or every couple of years. Call it a hundred. Uh, covered outdoor space, 50% of that. Um, standalone walls, 25% uh, of it, whatever that is. So that gives the people a very clear idea at the very beginning, you know, whether they require, they would hit that threshold or not. It's the same logic they were trying to apply into the house in the, in the paragraph in front. It's kind of a fairly standard way, like Bart brings up, that the building department comes up with, uh, for when you demo the whole house with this extension. So, that come up with a fairly simple way to do it. And keep it simple. The way to go. When you get in this non performance chapter, when we updated it in eight or ten years, and we took 16 hours with Chris White trying to work our way through it. Remember that, Bart? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but if we want to use. He does, too. If we want to use the same baseline number for the replacement, for the existing house replacement, and for the proposed improvement, then the value approach would be the same as the floor area approach. They're the same thing. Hey, you just say the value is $1 per square foot, and the proportions are still the same. If that matches, that's ideal, but I just want needs to match. Just apply the same model to something else, pole signs, okay? If that, if that applies there and it works, then great. Then we use that model. I think we should use that model consistently. So there's, you know, there's continuity in our, in our, in how we regulate uh, non-conforming. So, Excuse me. Um, so it's a few minutes after seven. Um, I know we've been talking about this issue for a while. Um, uh, Chris, if you've got enough from us on this, we're going to have to come obviously revisit, you know, the, you know, a, a portion of this um, at another study session. Um, but if you've got enough from us, then maybe we could wrap that wrap this up um, for today. And but you t you tell us if you need anything else from us. I don't think I need anything on this item. I I do want to ask Gabriel about the timing of the meeting and should, uh, whether time is wrapped up to discuss any other items. Yeah, um, Chris, you might want to lay out how much more is you need to cover and how much time you think it's going to take to cover that because there's also the accessory dwelling unit section. And we don't have the regular planning commission meeting at seven o'clock, so we could uh, continue. Uh, but I would recommend, you know, to the commission that we think about that timing as well. If you're willing to go past seven o'clock, I, I only need ten minutes to go over the next item. All right. So why don't we continue to uh, seven twenty? Plan on being here till seven twenty, and um, Chris. We'll keep moving forward. Thank you. So the, the next item is related to the review of additions to nonconforming structures. Uh, 
currently a minor architectural permit or a staff waiver is required for an addition to a, a non-conforming structure. Uh, we have processed, I have here a total of 30 staff waivers and 12 minor architectural permits over five years in which and this this is a portion of them that were entirely in conformance with the zoning ordinance. There was no minor exception permits approved. They were all approved. There was no major change in outcome as a result of a public hearing. There was no appeals. There were no, as far as I, I understand, there's a consistent understanding of staff that these typically are items that take more time. The, there is more time that outweighs what appears to be um, public benefit of having hearings through this process. Uh, the idea of a public hearing process, there's more than one reason for it, but ultimately the reason why a public hearing process was required for these projects was the potential of concern. And so staff is recommending that for projects under 50 percent that they would be approved, that they could be reviewed at a staff level through a building permit with the understanding that they would be entirely in conformance with the zoning code, they would not be in the architectural overlay, they would not be abutting historic structures. Um, and they would be under 50%. So that that's staff's recommendation. I agree. I support that. I think that's pretty, keep it simple, let's maybe <clears throat> encourage more people to update some of their, their houses. I think that's great. Crandall, Crandall also agrees. And you said how many, uh, you had about 30 that had gone to a review and there were no changes or anything like that as a result of the review? So staff processed 30 staff waivers. So those are all done at a staff level. Um, those, those are projects that are typically 500 square feet or less that don't increase the height of a dwelling. And then there's 12 minor, ar minor architectural permits that were processed and all of those were approved over five years. So that's an uh, average of seven types of applications reviewed a year. I, I can tell I have two of these right now. They take a good amount of time, and um, time is limited. So it, it, I think that that's the way staff would encourage the commission to think about it. Do we get do we get the value of staff time um, on this type of process? So you get the value of staff time on the, on the ones that are going up to the 2,100 square feet on the famous Park Crandall mobiles there, and uh, let uh, these things uh, become ministerial. You better handle them at the counter. That's why I'm in support of it. So you're talking page 31, right? 31 of 78. Am I correct? Page, Attachment six. Page 30. Uh, page page 30 summarizes the the current situation. I'm just wondering, I mean, I, 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 uh, allowing, you know, reducing staff time and allowing staff to assess it is good for everybody if it's, it doesn't produce problems. I'm just trying to get a, an understanding of, of what we've seen. And you're saying in the last five years, there have been 12 minor architectural permits, if I'm understanding correctly. There have been 12 minor architectural permits that have gone to planning. And 30 staff waivers, 42 total. 12 minor architectural permits that did not involve any uh, minor exceptions 
or involved architectural overlay or historic structures being near historic structures. So strictly additions to nonconforming structures with projects that entirely conform to the zoning ordinance. And you've had 12 of those? Yes. Okay. And there were no issues with them, no problems, no special considerations that were needed? My understanding is no issues that are germane to the findings. Like there are there are at times people saying that they didn't like that a project blocked their view or they didn't like where a window was and there was uh, an issue about a light on a project, something like that that wasn't directly tied to the findings. And there are, we don't have a view protection ordinance. We don't have regulations that control where a window can be uh, in relationship to another window. We don't have uh, like a lighting issue. We have the dark sky policy and we have lighting standards. So those issues are not directly tied to the findings that are associated with whether someone should be expanding a non-conforming structure in character with the neighborhood and whether it's it's consistent with the intent of the zone. So those sort of findings, staff routinely is able to meet those findings and uh, and consistently wonders why are we working on these? Why are we spending this much time on these applications? Hey, hey Chris, I, I'm just going to weigh in on this again. I, I, uh, I appreciate um, I appreciate what our current process does for our community, and you know, to Don's point, you know, it's moving projects along, and you know, you throw out a number, you know, whatever that number is, you know, it sounds like it's a healthy progression, and you know, and movement forward. Folks are getting through these pretty quickly, and I, I definitely am all about that, and I definitely think that it's it's, it's good to find ways to you know foster. Uh, improvement to properties and you know and help our help our residents you know, do what they need to do in a way that's not confusing or cost prohibitive or time prohibitive. But in terms of uh, you know continuity and structure to our code, again you know we, we have the same sort of language in here that talks about the value of a project and fifty percent. I'm just pointing out another area that is you know. You know that it's a good it's a good place to start when it comes to tying our standards together, and making sure that there's the same sort of set of rules applied to everything. And if we have exceptions, um, or if there's an additional uh, step to take for an applicant, I don't know that our number would have changed any. I mean, it's hard to say. So if we had how many did you say went through last year? Was it twelve? Uh, last year we had uh, we had two in 2019 minor okay. minor architectural permits and one staff waiver okay well I mean would it be any different if we took a closer look at a project that you know if there's an extra step I mean to have a just a wholesale application to these I mean all I'm saying is there should be a discussion on some continuity in our language. If we're going to, you know, based on value here, we should based on value everywhere else. I mean, if it's going to be an expansion of a property physically that breaches that threshold, whatever it is, if it's 50 percent physical, you know, change to the to the structure or the property, then you know, it's subject to a you know X Y Z set of you know. Um, processes, whatever it is. Yeah, yes, to be clear, what staff's recommending is that if if uh, buildings are expanded 50% or greater, then they must be made conforming. The only exception are single family residences that are 1,400 square feet or smaller. Uh, they can be expanded over 50% up to 2,100 square feet. 21. That would continue to require zoning administrator approval. So that would continue okay. the, the existing process. Okay. 
That's why I support it. I think it's, uh, it moves a lot of stuff through the system, and we can uh, upgrade our our communities and neighborhoods faster. So I just yeah. Think so, so with this, the, you know, the, uh, those are the small houses, and I don't see much of a problem with that. What about a 3,000, 4,000 square foot house that is doing a 49% That's a whole different category change? It's under 50%? But what All we're right, saying is, oh, it, uh, my understanding is, is a 4,000 square foot house is, is a bit large, but we've got plenty of houses that are, that are big here. Sure. They can expand that by 2,000 square feet and, or almost, you know, 1,999 square feet. And they don't need, you know, they got purely a staff review. They don't need ZA approval. They don't need to come to planning commission. So that's, you know, is that a concern we should have? It's just continuity. It's fairness. I mean, for everybody. Maybe, you know, maybe our housing stock is, you know, majority of it is under that threshold, and then we've got you know, uh, you know, we've got a smaller percentage, but yeah, they're they're much larger properties, much larger dwelling units, and maybe our frequency of expansions is lower with those, but their rights should be the same. I don't see any different. I just don't well, see why. Uh, there is there is a minimum, right? I mean, uh, uh, when you're talking someone who can maybe do nearly two thousand feet expansion and they have to go through the same review of someone doing a 500 foot expansion it starts it's like well there you're practically you know for some people that's a new house right 2,000 feet they're, they're essentially building a new house and they don't need any review they don't need any you know how does that impact the neighborhood in 2,000 square feet how many new bedrooms can you put in how many you know uh, uh, you know how many architectural changes you can have that can affect other places, uh, how many, you know, that's, I, I don't, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm asking the question because it's not, you know, here, what's written here for the size of these structures, it all looks fine, but we've got other size structures where that same percentage is going to have uh, much more, uh, it's going to have a qualitatively different, or could have, potentially, a qualitatively Absolutely. different impact. Even if it's the same percentages. Yeah, and we're That's talking conforming versus non-conforming, though, just to make sure we, you know, but that's valid. Absolutely. So there should be some continuity there. Absolutely. I just support this, uh, this uh, loosening or, or deregulation. Uh, it's going to make it a little easier for people to improve their um, property. Uh, so... I think based on the limited number of the, the cases in the past five years and the uh, limited impact to the neighborhood, I would support it. Uh, although I, I, I think Chair Ruling has a valid point. So perhaps we can add a cap to the, the absolute number of the floor area. For example, a thousand square feet or something, in addition to the 50% cap. So, uh, staff just wants to point out that additions are measured cumulatively since 1996. And what Chris is saying there is that if you think there's a 4,000 square foot house, um, one, it's probably not going to be non-conforming, so it doesn't fall under this category to do a 2,000 addition. If it is non-conforming and they've done one remodel already, they can't do another one um, and exceed the 50%. Right. Chris, do you have a chart of this uh, 12 or, or whatever number of the cases in the past five years? Do you know how much they expanded on average? Or what's the distribution? What is the maximum? What is the minimum? What is the average? I do not have the statistics right now, but uh, I, I do have a list in front of me. I I know that generally they've been homes that are west of the five freeway, and they're often not McMansions. They're projects that I'm looking at the numbers. They range from 300 square feet to... Uh, here's one up to 963 square feet. 
Well, Ben Avenue, this, De La, La Paz. Well, this is why the physical component is super important. To Bart's point, I I hear that as yes, we should pay attention to the you know the size of the expansion versus the value of it. So let me suggest this. It sounds to me like, at least in general philosophy, there's 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 a good consensus that we agree with where we're going with this, and certainly with the size of the examples that are in here. Um, my concerns were more with sort of uh, east of the five, as some of these homes say in Talega, start to age out a little bit. They're you know they're getting to be twenty years old, even some thirty maybe. So people are going to start remodeling, and you know maybe we might get, you know, there's a concern about a wholesale, you know, expansion there. But there are a lot of coverage rules, and you know I, I I don't want to, I don't want to plan for a problem that doesn't exist and may never exist. So <laughs> I wanted to bring up the concern because it was a concern, but maybe Chris has enough to uh, put a bow on this, and. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess I'll be content with that. I don't think that there's a, a roaring desire to worry about, you know, four thousand square foot houses houses in this context. So maybe that's it's time to move on a little bit uh, from that. Um, so uh, I don't know. Does anyone have anything else to contribute um, uh, for Chris? Does, does anyone else have something they want Chris to take away? Or is oh, it, so I think he's better those numbers, so I don't like to know know those numbers. I can provide those to the commission. Okay. Okay. W what is the maximum number? If you can just uh, quickly flip through it, you just mentioned something is nine hundred or something. I think I would rather look at these and give you give you something better than just reading it off. From what I can tell, the biggest right now that I can see is 963 square feet. But I think to give you an accurate number, I'm going to need a little bit more time to look at it. Okay. So if if, if nine, 900 something were the maximum out of that dozen cases, then putting a cap of a 1,000 square feet would not prevent any of them if it were happening in the future. And would also address that a little that concern from uh, Commissioner Ruling or Chair Ruling. I think I can at the next meeting I can explain why I don't think that the homes east of the freeway are a large concern to staff. There there are reasons for that. If you if it doesn't take much time and you can give an explanation for that, you know, for for our our comfort, um, uh, if for nothing else then that would be appreciated. Now, keeping in mind we're talking about conforming versus non-conforming, right? Mm -hmm. So anything that's conforming, it's kind of out of the discussion. We're talking about non-conforming rules here. Yep. Thank you All for right, the input. All right. Thank you very much, Christopher. And um, unless uh, uh, Jennifer... Christopher or Gabriel, if you've got something of burning urgency, we can maybe continue this to the next study session and um, and wrap up the meeting. What's your pleasure? Um, Chairman Rulin and, and Commissioners, uh, I'd like to just ask Jennifer, just if you could mention to the Commission what's next to cover and uh, uh, if they would like to cover it now or wait until another study session. This is Jennifer. The next subject area is accessory dwelling units. And uh, we are largely um, largely directed by state law to make specific modifications to our code. And that's a very quick summary. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, I looked at this whole thing. It's pretty much a the way the cards have been dealt to us, we don't have a lot of wiggle room here, and, and uh, the people up in Sacramento are getting really good at writing very detailed state laws. And you're talking about a different setbacks for four feet or five feet and all that. So when you read this whole thing, uh, it's pretty well what we, what we see is what we get. We don't have a lot of choice to it. The 
the one area I do have a concern with was on the occupancy. And on page 64 in there, there's a, there's a window there from about now, January 19, 2020 to January 25, where you have an ADU permitted, but uh, in this current five-year window, you don't have to have, a, you're not subject to any own occupancy requirements. That everything is done before me. And the only thing that uh, that raises a little trigger with me is it was comes, even though the, the ordinance says you can't, you know, rent these things or anything below 30 days and all that stuff in the ordinance and stuff that we've got issued to. I just, all of a sudden it's VRBOs and silver living homes because of no owner occupancy. It should be put some hook in there that says, yay, barely. You know, a total rental property type thing. Do we have total, right? Do they get, uh, TOT taxes, Jennifer, all, all this stuff? They need to sign up for all that stuff. We need it. <coughs> My only problem is pretty soon we have this growth industry again, like we had several years ago. Thank you. And just to note that, um, ADUs cannot be rented for less than 30 days. Correct. So from a, um, a vacation rental type scenario, you'd be a lot less likely uh, to run into that with that uh, rental day limitation. I would have sober living though. Jennifer, this I'm, is. Go ahead. Jennifer, um, this is Zhang. Um, uh, overall, I like this revision. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Commissioner Wu, I don't think. Um, Commissioner Brown got an answer to his question. Oh, okay. Yes, and if I wouldn't um, maybe reach out to Gabriel to help me uh, identify whether sober living homes require any type of review uh, with the city currently. Um, however, if they don't, um, which I believe is consistent with state law, uh, there is no opportunity for us uh, to limit the ADUs to not being the sober living home. Okay, that's not like the rest of the section is pretty good. I mean, there's nothing we can do about it. This really area has potential of a concern. Let's not have a, a sermon on, on the mountain. On it. I'm ready to hear it. <laughs> Commissioner Rue, did you have something to add? Yes, uh, Jennifer. Um, overall, I support this revision. This is, uh, much of it is driven by state law, so there's not much to talk about. And uh, I, I do have two, two minor questions I'd like to get a clarification on page 62. Um, item 2.B.2. When there is a for, the, for example, a single-family home that needs discretional review, at the same time, an ADU is proposed. Is the city allowed to review, is, is the city allowed to consider the impact of the ADU when they review the main project? Uh, uh, no, uh, it's it's not discretionary. Um, it would have to be processed ministerially. Uh, so, so, giving you a little more detail. Um, so, if you're looking at a discretionary application for a new single-family dwelling, a lot of your considerations are uh, potentially discretionary. There are some more uh, objective standards that you're looking at. So that being said, um, because an ADU or JDU cannot be discretionary, that the impact of the ADU or JDU could not be considered um, in consideration with the new single family dwelling. So the project would be reviewed with or without the ADU in exact the same way? Correct. Okay. Um, the second question is uh, on the next page. Um, Talking about a connection fee, 
Um, what is the current city sewer fee? Last time I heard about it, it was an exorbitant number. Has the city fixed it? So my understanding is at this time, the um, there is a moratorium on charging that fee. And I don't know the status of a solution to correct that. Um, but we can definitely find that out and provide that information at a future date. OK. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Anything else on the ADE ordinance, part of the ordinance? All right. Then um, is there anything else that staff has for us? Gabriel? Jennifer? Uh, that was it for uh, this evening's study session. And I'll let Gabriel jump in if he has anything else. Chairman and, and Planning Commissioners, that, that's it. I know that's the second batch of code amendments that uh, Planning Division has to present. Uh, and I believe um, we have enough information gathered from the past two study sessions to present something back to the Planning Commission at a future uh, hearing. And uh, there's direction that we received, uh, unless I'm, you know, um, unless I'm, I'm misunderstanding. And, you know, I just want to also ask Jennifer if you believe you have everything you need based on uh, this day session and the last day session. Thank you. And I need to um, correct the record. Uh, for the ADUs, we actually did receive a public comment on the proposed uh, uh, ordinance. And it brings up, uh, we received one public written Sorry, <laughs> we received one written public comment. And we've also received some input uh, verbally as well. And the public comment uh, has concerns about whether the ADU can or cannot be in front of the single family dwelling. And there are some development standards that we carried over from our existing ordinance into the proposed ordinance that relate to whether, um, well, specifically that an ADU cannot be within in front of a single family dwelling. Uh, the second concern that was raised uh, verbally was whether or not we should continue um, the the difficulty with putting a an ADU over a garage, and so there was concern in previous iterations of our ordinance that uh, a property owner could not put a an ADU over a garage. As our provisions are currently written, it would allow it would prohibit an AGU in front of a single family uh, residence in most instances and would not allow an ADU to be constructed over, uh, a, say, a detached garage. But at the very end of the provision, uh, it does allow an applicant to apply for a discretionary application, such as a conditional use permit, to uh, provide an ADU in either of those instances, either in front of a an, uh, single family dwelling or above a detached garage, which would be greater than 16 feet. Um, so given those two provisions that uh, we did have comments on, uh, would the commission recommend any changes or provide any direction to, for changes to write into the existing code to allow an ADU into, in front of a residence or on top of a garage? without a discretionary permit, or does it make sense to require a use permit in either of those cases? I see some nodding heads, I, I, and I, I think your people are saying, yes, we probably should have a discretionary permit in those, in those cases, and, and I would agree. I concur. Great. Yep, I agree. Great, thank you. Um, so then to answer Gabriel's question, yes, we have everything we need. I, I, I do, Jim, if I may make a comment generally as, uh, as it relates to our code amendments and our focus areas. I wanted to uh, maybe punt this over to Gabriel. I noticed something in our code. Um, is Chris still on the call? Chris Wright? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still on the Well, Chris who? Where's Chris? Chris. 
Chris Wright's on the call. He's, yeah, Chris Wright. Yeah. Not Chichinsky. Okay. Well, Chris, um, he has, uh, you know, background in wireless, but what I noticed in our, in our code is that when we have, um, you know, when we have a, uh, we have a uh, maximum height limit in a particular zone and we have um, architectural elements that are allowed to exceed that height limit. Uh, we have a situation where if a new use comes in, we uh, that new use is, is able to to um, integrate into that existing structure and exceed uh, a height limit uh, that would normally be um, in place for any new development. And Maybe it's a, a, a later discussion, but I, it just it haunts me every time I see that. And many cities have this where you know, you've got to say, for example, um, uh, a telecommunication service provider would come in and identify a structure in the commercial zone, and there may be a limit to height, but that, that particular existing structure is you know, 10 feet above the allowable height limit for new structures, and you know, maybe there's an elevator shaft or stairwell or steeple element and a new use can be established by attaching to that existing structure that may be over the height limit. At what point do we stop and, and take a look at this and we're establishing a new use on a property through you know, discretionary permit, conditional use permit, whatever it is, but we're allowing that new use to exceed the height limit for that zone because that particular existing structure has elements that are above the height limit. Shouldn't that new use be subject to the development standards if it was standing alone? It's a new use. So you've got a you know commercial building. Maybe it's a um, you know a, a um, you know a florist. And they've got a you know a tall building in town and. Somebody comes in and wants to put some wireless antennas on the roof, uh, you know, on an element of the building that is you know, 10 feet above the height limit for a new use in the zone. But they're able to do it. Why aren't we addressing that? Why are there, why aren't we addressing that? Hey, Gabriel, you're on mute. I haven't gotten to it yet. Commissioner, are you referring to a particular section of the code that, that particularly allows that? Um, are you talking about wireless specifically? Well, it could be wireless, not to not to limit it to wireless, but that would be you know a great example. Yes. I, I uh, forgive me, but um, I'm a little bit concerned because the uh, the it's a public meeting and the agenda for the item was. Um, uh, you know, was the zoning ordinance Understood. Uh, amendments that were specific here. I'm not saying it, that your question is irrelevant, but maybe uh, 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 take it offline or or something like that. Or it, just, It's just food for thought in, in closing. I, I appreciate that, and thank you, Jim, for pointing it out. You're correct. I, I don't mean to have a full discussion on, on something new. I'm just saying that there is there's there's a section in, you know, Worthy of discussion in our code. When we're talking about amendments, maybe this is something that we can consider down the road for further discussion. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good, Commissioner Blackwell. I'll I'll, okay. I'll give you a call just to follow up with you on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, that that's the uh, only item we have on our agenda, so we can entertain a motion for adjournment. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion that we uh, adjourn to the next regular meeting of the study session of Planning Commission. It will be held on August 19th, 2020 at 6 p.m. via teleconference. Second. Kaczynski. Motion by uh, Commissioner Crandall, second by Commissioner Kaczynski. I'll call the roll here. Uh, Commissioner Crandall? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Here. Aye. Commissioner Kaczynski? Aye. Commissioner Blackwell? Aye. Commissioner Wu? Aye. And uh, to rule and votes, aye. Uh, it's unanimous, and we are adjourned until our next meeting. Good night. Nice evening, everyone. Thank you.